Welcome to Central United Methodist Church of Phoenix's blended traditional, non-traditional worship service. That sounds a little bit schizophrenic when you put it that way. Regardless, I am Paul Borneman, pastor of this church, bringing you a virtual worship experience on this fourth Sunday of Easter from our beautiful Chapel of Light on the northwest corner of this campus. We welcome you today on Facebook and YouTube and look forward to meeting you as soon as pandemic mitigation restrictions are lifted. Until such time, I invite you to email the church with your selfies that while we are separated, I may still become acquainted with your face. Those selfies are beginning to come in or are being placed on my office wall. But for now, sit back and make yourselves comfortable, knowing that you are always welcome. And let us prepare ourselves, hearts, minds, and spirits, for worship of Almighty God.
it's hard to breathe sometimes these nights are long you've lost the will to fight is anybody out there can you lead me to the lake is anybody out there telling me it'll all be all right teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. 
They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. May the peace of Christ dwell where the word of God is spoken. Thanks be to God. As you would expect, family and friends are all curious about Central Church since the announcement of my appointment. They understandably want to know what the church is like. And the truth is that I'm still finding out. The normal means whereby pastor and parish get to know each other is sorely hindered by restrictions like this prohibiting our gathering because of COVID-19 mitigation efforts. So, what I have done is direct family and friends to our church website, centralumc.com, and invited them to subscribe to our e-blast on the Facebook page along the sidebar marked Newsletters. There's also a photo section in the sidebar which gives an idea of the glory of Central Church. Now, I don't need to tell you that this campus is beautiful. But the photos on our website hardly do it justice, not because of the photography, but because of the grandeur of the space. Additionally, some of you know, and others are yet discovering, that I am being dragged kicking and screaming into the 21st century, technologically speaking. I get along fine with my laptop and emails, but cell phones, Facebook, Tinder, Snapchat, Snapchat etc., no thank you. Yet even as technologically challenged as I admit to being, I can envision having a video made with a drone flying through our sanctuary and stopping by the many gorgeous features, especially the stained glass windows, while someone narrates their significance, all underscored by sacred organ music. Now, wouldn't that be a wonderful addition to our webpage? Maybe, someday, I have a lot of ideas. But the true beauty of any church is not in its building, it's in its people. Thus, the one thing I found sorely lacking in our church photo gallery was that there were no discernible pictures of our worshiping congregation. And admittedly, a drone video of empty pews would do nothing to convey vitality. Here's a central church picture from 1951. Even though this photo is older than I, these saints of the past are now a part of the spiritual family into which I have been adopted, into your family. Of course, most of these people have no doubt gone on to glory, but I love them. They all look so happy. They were pretty snappy dressers then, even though now they are out of style. It's a snapshot of this church frozen for a moment in time. Everything has changed. Everybody has changed. But we're still a church. Even though separated, we still find a way to gather together. A snapshot of the church is what we get in our scripture reading from Acts today. It's a beautiful picture. Everybody's wearing their Sunday best. It's as if the author held up a camera and everybody smiled. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayers. They ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all of the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number. So perfect. So idealistic. So much so, some scholars suggest it is an idealized picture of the church. Almost as if it's been airbrushed and touched up to remove the blemishes and make everybody look good sort of like a church directory. In other words, it's what every church ought to be, but I've got to tell you, it's not like any real church I know. 
Through the years, I've worshipped in a great many churches. Chances are so of you. And I've developed friendships among people from a wide variety of church backgrounds across the spectrum from fundamental literalists who argue that God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, to postmodern theological progressives who aren't quite sure what they believe because they question everything. And throughout my pastoral ministry, I've been involved in several ministerial associations where area clergy meet as an ecumenical body to discuss how we can join together in community outreach. I know that sounds like a good and noble goal, and there are some notable successes we have shared. But let me fill you in on a little secret. We also spend way too much time, to my way of thinking, griping about the churches we serve. I have been in ministeriums with clergy who are fellow United Methodist, Roman Catholic, United Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Mennonite, postmodern, post-denominational progressive, and even independent, non-denominational, free church fundamentalists. And there is one absolute I've found that we have in common. The pictures we share of our churches does not resemble this picture from Acts. The pictures we show have this guy angry with that guy, these two women who haven't spoken for years, this family who no longer attends, this committee warring with that committee over limited resources, and they haven't reached their budget in years. In other words, half of the people are frowning, and the other half have their eyes closed. It's not a pretty picture. Of course, we don't have anything like that here at Central, do we? But then again, I wouldn't know. I've yet to meet most of you. But it does raise the question, is this picture in Acts realistic or just the wishful thinking of the author who by the time he wrote Acts was already dealing with a conflicted and troubled church and was urging them to remember the teachings of Jesus and the workings of the Holy Spirit. Because in my reading of Holy Writ, the early church was made of the same ordinary, oft-times ornery types of people who claim membership today. Lord knows people have yearned to be part of this Acts picture. Every now and then, some cluster of folks is announcing the organized church has failed, but they are creating the true perfect church like the one in our reading. Some have gone so far as selling all of their property to live together in community. But it never turns out. The church in Acts is created by the Spirit, and these utopian communities either develop the same strain of viral conflict or over-organization that plagued the churches they left, or they become oppressive when a leader or board tries to control everyone into being as perfect as they, or at least pretending to be so. You simply can't legislate people into having glad and generous hearts. So shall we say the snapshot in Acts is so idealized as to be unreal? I don't think so. In fact, I think this picture of the church in Acts is quite real. It's a true picture of the church at the time, and I suspect also true of Central Church today. Yes, the church today, as then, may seem old-fashioned, out of style, out of step with culture. As Monica Hall puts it, in America, we have this thing right now that empires tell us what works. If it is a bestseller, it's the answer. Where is the just being together of people who confess the same thing? 
They clung to one another and gave thanks by saying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not in getting on the New York Times bestseller list for telling us how to do church. She continues, As hard as this is to hear as a people who have rethought success, this is who we are. This is where we have come from. And this is our community. You see, the book of Acts does offer us a family picture of our church today. Look closely and you may recognize some of the faces. In all the reading I've done on church history, at its best, it is pictured as living a life of learning, fellowship, hospitality, generosity, and worship. It is our common commitment to Christ which continues to bring us together, even in this virtual format where we are living in a time and culture and social structure different from any other we have known. But it still breaks my heart, as I know it must yours, to see the opening slides for these blended services listing our many ministries all canceled until COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. It's gut-wrenching. Canceled are Sunday school classes for children, United Methodist Women, Central Book Club, Live to Serve, Serve to Live opportunities like offering counters, transportation ministry, Wednesday Wonders, You Mom Outreach Team. Canceled are our prayer ministry, Central Community Choir, journaling as a spiritual practice, chair yoga classes, helping hands, prayer shawl and baby blanket ministry, three F's of food, fellowship, and fun lunches. It hurts even to list them. Because through the years, over and over again, I have heard people say, I don't know how I would have made it through this without the church. My guess is that so have you. And many of you may have said so yourselves. In her book, Traveling Mercies, Annie Lamont describes the little church that called her home to God. She writes, Most of the people I know who have what I want, which is to say purpose, heart, balance, gratitude, joy, are people with a deep sense of spirituality. They are people in community who pray or practice their faith, they are Buddhists, Jews, Christians, people banding together to work on themselves and for human rights. They follow a brighter light than the glimmer of their own candle. They are part of something beautiful. Our funky little church is filled with people who are working for peace and freedom, who are out there on the streets and inside praying, and they are home writing letters, and they are at the shelters with giant platters of food. She adds, when I was at the end of my rope, the people at St. Andrews tied a knot in it for me and helped me hold on. The church became my home in the old meaning of home, that is where, when you show up, they have to let you in. They let me in. They even said, you come back now. I think I know the church she's describing. It's you, and it's me. Ordinary, ornery human beings all, but still, God calls us together to be the body of Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God in the flesh, in our here 
in our now. So even in this Easter season of separation, let us unite in praying that we will soon be able to gather together again as if for the first time. And may we also invite others to join us because, you see, they too are children of God. Let us be renewed and recommitted to being a people of goodwill for no other reason than because this is whom we are called to be. And when we do, let's not be surprised when every day our numbers increase. So I want you to do me a favor. Hold still, scrunch together. Okay, now, on three, say cheese. One, two, three. It's a little bit fast there. But it's perfect. Let us pray. O oh God of signs and wonders, open our eyes to the marvelous evidence of your care for us. Open our ears that we may hear you calling us by name. Link us with one another into a true community of caring in which the needs of each are the concern of all. And shower your goodness and mercy on all who virtually gather here that we may be equipped to share your blessings now and in the days to come. Amen. Let us join together in this historic affirmation of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. We're using the ecumenical version. Please unite with me in saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In today's prayers of the people, 
I will conclude each petition by saying, We pray to you, O Lord, to which you are invited to respond, Kyrie eleison, meaning, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For all who believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease, and that all may be one, as you and the Father are one, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For those who do not yet believe, and for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For all who live and work in this community, especially those on the front lines of quelling the coronavirus, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For a return to the blessing of human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord, Kyrie eleison. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For this congregation, unable to gather together during the season of pandemic, yet united in spirit to show forth your glory in all that we do, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For ourselves, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for the grace of the Holy Spirit to amend our lives, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, for our families, friends, and neighbors, that being free from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health, we pray to you, O Lord. Kyrie eleison. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us now continue our worship with joining our voices together in singing our Lord's Prayer.
messages that were left on the telephone when he assumed that office. I've since found out that the telephone system was set up for when this church was much larger, much heavier in staff, and that there were multiple tiers of places where telephone calls could be sent from being cleared through the church office. Now obviously we don't need such a complex system now. In fact, no one even knows how to operate it. So in the meantime, the only way I can receive calls in the office is if there's someone in the front office who is able to relay those. And there's no one there due to the pandemic. Except for on Monday mornings when Marilyn is here to sort and count and deposit our church offering. And she was there in the office and forwarded my first telephone call, which I got. It was a homeless person seeking help. She told me her story of woe, which indeed was heartfelt. And I had to explain to her that I'm relatively new here. I've been here two weeks. And I don't know our networking system whereby I'm able to refer her elsewhere. And also because of the pandemic, we are not meeting as a congregation. Our offerings are quite stilted now. And that we are unable to offer any aid at this time. However, I would keep her in my prayers. And that humble soul said, and I will pray for the church. Thank you, members who continue to support Central with your regular offering, and thank you, guests who continue to give through our church website, centralumc.com. Because it is because of your faithfulness that we hold to the promise of a more glorious future for all. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. with 
with each other in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my joyous now. To take each moment and Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.